Good morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you know the things that have gone on for each one of us this morning so far. You know the things that are clouding our horizons, the things that bring us joy, the things that distract us. Father, you've brought us here this morning to gather together and give you the praise that is your due, but most importantly, to hear your word. So, Father, would you please address us? Would you please shape us to be faithful disciples of Jesus? Use your word to do your work, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there are some stains that cannot easily be removed. They've penetrated so far into the fabric, into that shirt or into the carpet, that they stubbornly resist every effort to remove them. Some injuries are so deep, they're not easily mended. It takes medical skill and prolonged recovery time, sometimes with rehab and physiotherapy. And even then, lasting consequences might remain. Some trauma is so devastating, it cannot, we cannot easily recover. I suspect you'll know that from your own experience. You can do the quick wipe over, I've done it many times, uh, try the instant remedy, speak the easy word, and it just doesn't work. In fact, it often makes the problem worse. The stain smudges, the glib word causes even more pain. And if you've ever been in such a situation, perhaps you've realised that you've underestimated the problem, underestimated the damage, and so you've underestimated just what it will take to set things right. I think it is very easy for us to underestimate the problem we all face as human beings, as those created by the one true and living God, placed in the world that he's created, so that we might live in joyful fellowship with him. The problem arises from inside us. The desire to live in God's world on our terms, to decide for ourselves what is good and what is not good for us, what the great American constitution calls the inalienable right of the pursuit of happiness. I suspect that most of us here this morning recognise there's a problem it's playing itself out on the large scale in our world and on the smaller, more intimate scale in our own lives. And what's more, we think we have some sense of what it would take to fix it. But do we really? Is it just possible that the problem is more intractable than we, even we, have imagined? And the solution is much more devastating. This morning, as we continue in our long journey through Matthew's Gospel, we arrive at that moment in Jesus' earthly ministry where the depth of the problem and the terrifying wonder of the solution is out in the open. I can't escape the sense, as we read these words or hear them read, that we're standing on holy ground. Here is a penetrating insight into who Jesus is and what he came to do. And it is so powerful, so intimate, that it shatters the shallow and superficial caricatures of what was about to happen. We get to see the real humanity of Jesus much, much more than just skin deep. We also get to see the genuine glory of his divinity, the true son of the Father and the only one who can save us. And we catch just a glimpse of the depth of what was going on at the cross. We get to see him alone, set apart and bearing our sins alone. And I take it, friends, these are such important things for us to see that it really is a very good thing that we get a chance to look at this passage again this morning. So I hope you do have your Bible open at Matthew 26, and let's begin at verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to the disciples, sit here while I go over there to pray. And taking Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. 
Then he said to them, My soul is full of sorrow, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, but not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Weren't you strong enough to watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. (coughs) Again, for a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, My father, if it is not possible for this to pass except I drink it, let your will be done. And coming again, he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And leaving them, he went away and prayed for a third time, saying the same thing. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, You slept for a while and are refreshed. Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's go. Look, my betrayer approaches. It was the Thursday night of the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. It was the week of the Passover, the night of the Passover meal, uh, when it was shared in every Jewish household. It was a night when they remembered another night, a night of waiting, a night of deliverance. Jesus had eaten the Passover with his disciples, but you remember he had redirected the focus of that meal from celebrating the deliverance from Egypt at the time of the Exodus to a new focus on him and what he was about to do. This is my body, he said. This is my blood of the covenant, shed for many for the forgiveness of sins, he said. There was still some waiting to be done, but it would be a different kind of waiting. And shockingly, Jesus had just told them ahead of time that they would fail. They would all soon be scattered. The loudest voice in protest would himself deny Jesus three times before the night was over, before the cock crowed. None of them would be up for this kind of waiting. Not this night. It would be possible to look at this incident entirely from the perspective of the first disciples. What happened in the garden was such a stark contrast to what they'd all just said as they made their way from the upper room in the city to the garden just outside the city walls. Even if I must die with you, I will most certainly not deny you, Peter had said. And all the disciples said the same. They were in this to the end. They would stand their ground. They would not draw back. They would stand up and be counted no matter what the cost. But if we keep our eyes on them in the verses I just read, we see monumental failure not just on the part of the twelve, but even more particularly on the part of the three Jesus took with him, Peter and James and John. They were brought further into the garden. They were told to watch and wait, but they could not do even that. For all the protests of loyalty and devotion, they could not do what needed to be done that night. They fell asleep. Weren't you strong enough to watch with me for one hour? Jesus asked when he returned the first time after praying. The answer was alarmingly obvious, no. No, they weren't up to it. You see, at this critical point in these critical events, they would not be participants. He was the only one who watched and prayed that night. He was terrifyingly alone. What he had to do that night and the next day would be done for them not with them. It is done by Jesus and by him alone. And so the disciples are not really the focus of attention, are they? As valuable as it is to be reminded that discipleship can be and is challenged by our human frailty and fragility, that we can't rely upon ourselves and our good intentions, First and foremost, it is Jesus we learn about in these events as they are recorded for us. And we get to see Jesus here 
as we've not seen him up to now. The Lord who stilled the storm, who raised the dead, who was not phased when he was opposed by demons or by the religious leaders, the one who walked on the water and stood alongside Elijah and Moses on the mountain, the Son of Man to whom all authority has been given to execute God's purpose on earth, he steps into this garden and immediately we're showing something different. He is sorrowful and troubled. He's shaken. In Luke's Gospel, we're told at one point that he was in agony and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling on the ground. What was it in the garden that confronted Jesus and brought about such distress? He faced the devil in the wilderness and didn't even flinch. But here he tells his disciples, my soul is full of sorrow even to death. What was the burden that he carried at that moment? What was it that Jesus saw approaching that those around him did not see? What was it that caused him to pause and then deliberately choose to, at this final moment, as throughout his whole ministry, choose to do the will of him who sent him? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is more transparently human than he is anywhere else in the Gospel. He was sorrowful and troubled. He was brought to the very edge. What pressed upon him was unbearable. He was all but overwhelmed. His soul was full of sorrow even to death. And it's because of this as much as anything else that he knows what it is like, what it's really like to be pressed to our limits, to be at breaking point. He went through that. And so he's able to sympathise with us in our weakness. Jesus was not a superhuman, impervious to terror, heading cheerfully to the cross. He was neither the heroic martyr who defiantly embraces death, we've seen plenty of them through history, nor was he a stoic, simply resigned to what lay ahead, aiming for that tranquility that comes through an indifference to the circumstances surrounding us. There had been plenty of them as well. There was nothing light or superficial about the suffering Jesus went through in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was genuinely human, and faced with what lay before him, he was in genuine anguish. That scene, too, in the way he took the three disciples with him. Those three had been with him on the Mount of Transfiguration, and they had seen his glory. Now they would come and see his grief. And notice what he asked of them there in verse 38. Remain here and watch with me. They could not do it. He knew that from the start. It was not the part they were to play that night. He had to be alone and what he had to do for them, he alone could do. But to bring them with him and to charge them to watch with me speaks of his human capacity and longing for companionship. He kept coming back to them. And the stark loneliness of that moment pressed itself upon him. His genuine, real and full humanity is seen as well in the way he placed his will at the service of his father's will. He'd been dedicated to his father's will all throughout his ministry. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and accomplish his work, he said at one point. I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, he said at another. At the very beginning of his ministry, Jesus had answered the first test from the devil in the wilderness with words from Deuteronomy, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That is how human beings were meant to live, directed by the word of God embracing the will of God. 
That is when human living is fully human living. Jesus will not turn, Jesus will did not stand over against God's will, challenging God's will, wrestling with God's will. His will was most fully human when it was aligned with his father's will. And his will was most fully divine when it embraced his father's will. Not my will but yours was not a momentary decision for Jesus. The but or however in verse 39 is not a change of mind on Jesus' part. This had been the pattern of his entire life. Not my will but yours. It's never a sign of weakness, indecision or lack of faith in Jesus. And it's never a sign of weakness, indecision or lack of faith in us. Not my will but yours is the very character of Christian prayer. This uh, intimate exchange between Jesus and his Father displays Jesus, our Saviour, as genuinely human and genuinely divine. It demonstrates, too, that what is happening at this point and all through the next few chapters has its real centre here in the eternal, unbreakable relation of the Father and the Son. What was happening in the garden reveals God's saving activity is deeply personal and relational. It's never impersonal, external or transactional. Its power lies not in the law, but in the common will of the Father and the Son. On both occasions when we hear the words Jesus prayed, he began, my Father. It's an unusual expression in the Gospels, not our Father, not Father, my Father. He is united in purpose and power and glory. With his father. So I come back to the critical question. What was it that Jesus saw approaching that night that brought such agony at the same time as he consciously, deliberately chose to do his father's will? It was certainly not the prospect of death itself, which terrified him most, nor was it even the physically excruciating nature of the death that lay before him. Certainly those things brought distress, but time and again he had shown he is the Lord of death. He knew how disruptive and unnatural human death always is, and he did not relish the physical agony of the cross, but what terrifies him becomes clear in the words he prays. My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me but not as I will, as you will. The issue is the cup. Not too long ago, Jesus had had another cup in his hands and he'd said, this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But it's not that cup he's talking about here. The cup is the familiar image throughout the Old Testament of God's righteous indignation against willful human rebellion. Isaiah 51, wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dredges, the bowl, the cup of staggering. Or Jeremiah 25, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword I'm sending among them. What distinguished the death of Jesus from any other death is this, that as he suffered and died there, the beloved son was drinking the cup of God's wrath. He would be delivered over, as he himself said, into the hands of sinners. They would do their worst and it would seem as if they triumphed. That's all the onlookers would see. But concealed under their apparent triumph would be the triumph of God. Jesus, more than anyone else, knew the reality and depth of God's wrath at sin. He knew it was terrifying. And yet if our sin, a problem much deeper than we often recognise, 
involving us at every level. If we are to be freed from our sin, he knew he must drain that cup until not a single drop remains. Everything that human sin rightly deserves is drained away, not by some arm's length transaction, but by God's own son, God himself, taking up the cup of his own wrath. And there would be nothing left when Jesus drank from that cup. Don't let anyone tell you that our salvation is easy. It was immensely costly. And the glory of it is that all the cost was borne by him. That's what Jesus saw approaching that night. And it rightly terrified him. He saw the great burden of the world, stained, injured and traumatised by human sin and entirely unable to avoid God's right, good and monumentally horrific judgement. Because of this single, determined grasping of the cup of divine wrath in the garden, as one man puts it, there is none of it left for us to drink. This moment in the garden, as well as demonstrating once again the weakness of the disciples and their need to be saved, showed the real humanity of Jesus. It showed the real, the genuine divinity of Jesus. It showed the true nature of the cross of Jesus. But there's one last thing it demonstrated that's important for us to recognise. The prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane makes clear that there is only one way of salvation. There was simply no other way to achieve the salvation of sinful men and women than God himself in the person of his son draining the cup of his own wrath. The stain is so deep, the injury is so severe, the trauma is so devastating that nothing else is able to answer the problem. And we know that once again by the words Jesus prayed. My father, if it's possible... Let this cup pass from me, but not as I will, as you will. My father, if it's not possible for this to pass, unless I drink it, let your will be done. And what is clear at the end of this incident, as Jesus and his disciples are joined by the betrayer and the host he brought with him, is that it was not possible. There was no other way. When anyone questions our focus on Jesus and the cross and protests that he's just one of many ways to God, the answer lies right here. The question was anticipated by Jesus himself, if it is possible, but it was not. He is the only one who could drink that cup. There is no other way. He is the only one who would triumph in the darkness. What God has given us in this record of what went on in the Garden of Gethsemane is incredibly precious, isn't it? It's a glimpse into the very heart of the most important moment in universal history. We see why the cross matters. We see what God was prepared to do, what God was himself prepared to bear to save you, to save me. Here on this holy ground, we see what it takes to cleanse the stain of sin thoroughly, to heal the injury of sin completely, and to remove the trauma of sin forever. So let's pray and give thanks for that, shall we? Our Father, we do thank you that so thoroughly have you dealt with our sin that the cup was so entirely drained that we are free to be your people, freed from sin, freed from guilt and shame. We recognise, Father, and we grieve that this was the cost that we have incurred. This is what we made necessary. But we rejoice that your love is so great that this is what you did for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you. In Jesus, in your own name, amen.